Yeah, although prosecutors don't have to show a motive to get a conviction for first degree murder, juries want to know the motive, especially when they see this clean cut guy with no criminal background. They want to know why he did it. Now, I think it's coming into focus why he did it. He seemed to be a devotee of serial killers and crime. I mean, he studied under the BTK's autobiographer. I mean, he was so interested in, in true crime that looks like he wanted to be the center of his own story. This is Reporter Room with Jessica Della Davies. Hello, Reporter Room investigators. Thank you so much for joining me today. We have a lot of stuff to talk about on the Brian Kohlberger case. My name is Jessica Della Davies. I'm an investigative journalist. My job is to consider crime scenes, criminals, and potential suspects, and show you how to do the same thing. If you haven't subscribed, please do like, share, leave a comment. My analytics show me that 50% of you guys who watch are not subscribed. Today, we're going to be talking about the affidavit and the real reason that Xana and Ethan did not call 911, why that eight-hour gap with the roommates. We're also going to be talking about the alibi. When was it really due? And did I make a mistake on this? I think I did. I'm going to show you where I believe BK threw that knife and the other evidence in the crime. Did he burn it? Did he bury it? We're going to talk about the IgG information also on this case. How is that going to change case law, if at all, in Idaho? I want to show you where I think BK threw the knife sheath. I, I have here marked Pullman, Washington. On the map, you can see here, Moscow, Idaho is over here. But on November 13th of 2022, BK drove all the way down here to Clarkston, Lewiston, where law enforcement picked him up on camera, entering and exiting Albertson's grocery store. They also have images of him at Albertson's. So what in the world was BK doing in Clarkston? Well, I think he was down there to get rid of his evidence. So why would he be all the way down here? There are shopping um, places. There's a In Pullman, Washington, there's a Safeway. So there are shopping places he could shop at that would be a lot closer. And Safeway is owned by the same company as Albertson. So why was he all the way down here? When Look at all the shopping options that he would have had right here in Pullman. So why did he need to come all the way to Clarkston to go shopping on November 13th around 12.45 p.m.? Well, let's look at why. So if we're looking at the map here, you can see the, the Pullman. Clarkston is all the way down here. Moscow is over here. And then let's look at what's over this way. Right here, we have the Nez Pierce Clearwater National Forest. This is a 770,000 acre forest. I just want to show you how vast it is. And I believe this is where, in fact, let me pull out a little bit. Look how big this is. This is where I believe he, he got rid of the evidence. You can see here all of this area. It would be law enforcement would be searching for a needle in a haystack. Look at how, how big this forest is. It's absolutely huge. Um, so I think this is why he went down to Clarkston, and I think this is where he got rid of the knife, and I think this is also where he got rid of other evidence. We know there was a shovel found in his Hyundai Elantra. So I want to talk to you guys about the theory of what happened and why Ethan and Xana did not call 911 that day. I believe that BK came in through the sliding glass doors on the second floor. And I am talking about this case in terms of BK, even though he is innocent until proven guilty. I'm talking about this case in terms of him because he's been the only one who's been convicted. He's the only one who's arrested. He's the only one sitting in jail without bail for these crimes. And he's the only one with his DNA on that knife sheath. So I believe that BK came in through the second floor patio doors. I believe he headed straight upstairs. I don't know if he went to Kaylee's room first, but she wasn't in there. And 
So he would have gone to Maddie's room and I, or he maybe went to Maddie's room first, but either way, I think he went into Maddie's room and I think he would have been very surprised to find Maddie and Kaylee in the same bed. And I think he did away with them. And I think it was different sounds than what people think that it was. People have talked about this as to why the roommates didn't call 911. Well, why didn't Ethan and Zana call 911 call 911 either? And I think it's because you can do away with people in such a way that you keep them from calling out. I think that he did away with Maddie and Kaylee and was headed back down the stairs. And Zana, in the meantime, had come out of her room to take her door dash bag because we've always wondered how that door dash bag ended up on the kitchen counter next to the kitchen sink. Well, I think she came out and she would have seen the patio doors were open. Moreover, she would have felt the cold air coming in. So I think Zana came out and I think that she called to Ethan, there's someone here. And I think this is who Dylan heard that she heard somebody say, there's someone here. At this point, BK would have gone into fight or flight response. And I believe that he came down the stairs, chased Zana back into her room and did away with her. And then at that point said to either Ethan or Zana, I'm here to help you, which is absolutely diabolical. Maybe he was going to do away with the roommates next. People are like, why did the roommates survive? Well, maybe he was afraid that Zana or Ethan had called 911 or someone had called 911 when he heard the, the call out that someone is here. So I think he would have been very panicked. And I think this is why Dylan saw him exiting quickly through the patio doors and he didn't see Dylan or if he did, he didn't care. He just wanted to get out of there at that point. So that is my theory on why the roommates survived. And that is my theory on why Ethan and Zana did not call 911 either. I want to correct something that I shared with you on the Idaho alibi. So I had told you guys, and this was a mistake on my part. It, the information came from Ann Taylor and it's not correct. Uh, it was reported out. So maybe they misquoted her or maybe she said it. I don't know. But it, the, she is the one that put out the information that she needed all the discovery from the prosecution before the defense had to turn over their alibi. Well, that is not the law in Idaho. Idaho, under state law, the defendant has 10 days from the request from the prosecution to turn over the alibi. A formal alibi will be provided by the defense team. And the defense notice has to include a specific place where the defense claims to have been and the names of the witnesses that will back this up. So prosecutors requested this in June of 2023. So why are we sitting here in March of 2024 and Ann Taylor is still claiming she needs more time for the alibi when it has been requested. The judge granted her an extension, but now we are here almost nine months later and she still hasn't given an alibi. So does this 10 day rule in Idaho apply to every single criminal defendant except for Brian Kohlberger? Because if it is, that's not fair. So let's look at this Idaho statute together. So this is from a law server. And the Idaho statute uh, basically says it's a, a notice of defense of alibi at any time after arraignment before a magistrate upon a complaint and upon written demand of the prosecuting attorney, the defendant shall serve within 10 days of such time as the court may direct upon the prosecuting attorney such a written notice of his intent intention to offer a defense of alibi. Now, this is because the prosecution also has a responsibility too, and I'm going to share that with you in just one second. So such notice by the defense, defendant shall state the specific time and places where the defendant claims to have been during the alleged offenses and the names addresses of the witnesses on whom established such an alibi. And this is so, this is so that we don't waste money seating a jury and bringing a case to trial only to have the defendant say, well, I was at the local 7-Eleven or I was at the 24-hour Walmart and that's my alibi. I'm on camera. See, here I am with my friend Bob. That's to prevent something like that happening. Now, the defense did not provide an alibi and now she did say she was driving around, 
But now she's claiming she's going to have another alibi, but she cannot give it unless she can see the prosecution video that shows whether they have BK's face on video or not. So she's really worried about this. I, you know, it's a good try, but it's not the law in Idaho. So the prosecution also has a responsibility to the defense team once they turn over the alibi within 10 days after receipt of the defendant's notice of alibi, but in no event less than 10 days before the trial, unless the court directs, because the judge has discretion here. He gave the defense team for Brian Kohlberger an, an extension to provide the alibi. So he can also grant an extension to the prosecution. The prosecuting attorney shall serve upon the defendant or his attorney a written notice stating the names and addresses of all the witnesses upon whom the prosecution intends to rely to establish the defendant's presence at the scene of the alleged offense and any other witnesses to be relied on to rebut the testimony of any defendant's alibi witnesses. Okay, so this is Idaho Code 19-59, Notice of Defense Alibi. So I wanted to share that with you because I did mistakenly just take Ann Taylor's word for it that the prosecution had to turn over everything to the defense team. That is just simply not the case. I also wanted to share with you guys this information. BK, it turns out he not only had trouble with female students at WSU, where he was grading female students differently from male students. It turns out he was booted from his high school vocational class for having difficulties with female students. So this happened when he was a junior in high school. My source on this is the New York Post. Let's go through this together. So this is coming from former administrator Tanya Carmela Beers. So she revealed that BK was brief was briefly on the protective services track at a vocational high school near his parents, Monroe County, Pennsylvania home. We know his parents live in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania. So she quote, says he was a leader in the class. He took the class extremely seriously. Now she did an interview with the Idaho Massacre podcast. So here is a photograph from BK's yearbook. It shows him in this pre-professional course in high school. So she went on to say, to be removed from this program is pretty severe. This is Carmela Beers talking about this, of the incident. She did not elaborate on exactly what happened, but I'm sure she will be called as a witness at the trial, I would imagine, because the prosecution is going to be very interested to show a pattern of behavior, right? If they can show this pattern of behavior, this dislike, intense hatred of women, then they're going to try to establish that through prior behavior issues starting in high school. So she said, quote, we had him removed from the program. When I look back on it now, it makes sense with what happened later. So she's talking about the Idaho 4 case later. So she says that, quote, makes sense with what happened later. So it does make me wonder what was going on in junior high school with Brian Kohlberger. BK then transitioned to an HVAC program, but ultimately decided not to return to the vocational high school for his senior year. This is again, according to Carmela Beers. He did finish his high school degree online. This source is the Idaho Statesman. He graduated from high school online in 2013. So he didn't return to class. So he, it does seem like he really was having trouble with with friends, with female friends in particular. So it gets more disturbing though. We know that BK lost a significant amount of weight and we've heard reports that he was bullying other people. And we are also hearing reports that he was a bully himself. It, it He is described as uh, losing a significant amount of weight and morphing into a more dominant bully, bullyish personality. This is according to hometown acquaintances. Notice they are not listing themselves as friends. The schoolyard outcast was allegedly uh, had issues with medication. I'm watching my words here. And in the wake of his arrest, he is remembered by former classmates as being smart, but slightly odd, particularly around girls. But wait, it gets more disturbing. Listen to this, you guys. So Dominic, this is from Dominic Clark, and this is to the New York Post, which is the 
paper I'm using. He said, quote, if he liked or was interested in a girl and she wasn't, he didn't understand why or he didn't accept her saying no and move on. And so he would have been labeled as a creep or something along the, those lines. So I think it's really concerning that he was ex not accepting no for an answer because no means no. So it is an issue that he's not respecting the boundaries of his classmates. Ann Taylor wanted the information on the IgG in the last hearing and Judge John Judge said no, that she could not just have the names of every single person who had submitted their DNA to one of these ancestry DNA type places in an effort to find an alternative defendant. Those weren't the words that she used, but that's what she's trying to do. And he told her no. If he did allow this, this would really call into question how safe it would be for anyone to use one of these sites for fear that they could be implicated in a case that maybe has nothing to do with them simply because they uploaded their DNA to a website. So it's a slippery slope. The judge wanted to balance the needs of the defense, but also protection for the people who supplied their DNA to these companies. So I wanted to show you proof that BK did have connections with the victims. So let's go. Let's look at the different connections that BK had with victims. I'm showing you multiple sources. He had pictures of the victims on his phone. He had photos of the victims on his phone. He had photos of one of the victims on his phone. He had an ID belonging to one of the victims inside a glove, inside a box. He was following two of the victims on Instagram and was DMing them over and over. He had been to the Mad Greek, where the, some of the victims worked. We know Maddie, Kaylee, and Xana all worked at the Mad Greek at some point. The Gonzalves parents also say that he was following Kaylee and Maddie on Instagram and that he was liking all of Maddie's photographs. Thank you so much for joining me today. Please subscribe and let me know what you think about all of this in the comment section below.